and hopefully, can you hear me? Yep, good, good. All right, um, <clears throat> there was some discussion today about what the order of these three persons that we're looking at. And um, while it may have been listed differently, this is my intention that tonight we'll start with Beekner, which I guess the first thing you learn if you don't know is that his last name's pronounced Beekner. So we'll get started. Um, this is a kind of second edition of a class we did last year. Uh, yesterday's saints, you know, we think about St. Augustine, St. Francis, etc. And that designation by the Roman Catholic Church is a kind of thing that they bestow, but it leads me to think about what are more recent saints. And of course, I think part of the problem with the word saint, and especially in artwork, is the halo, um, etc., and just what the word saint conjures up. The New Testament, though, really speaks of all of us as saints, and it uses the adjective hagios, uh, holy, but it uses it as a noun, so the holy ones or the saints, as we've translated it. And the idea is not sinlessness, but it's really set apart, as in set apart for God's work. So thankfully, one doesn't have to be sinless to do God's work. Uh, Mother Teresa would echo an amen to that, as would Augustine and so many of the others. And I quoted last time theologian Elizabeth Johnson, who she refers to All Saints Day as the Feast of Splendid Nobodies. So it just reminds me that there are saints past and present that we're never going to hear of. They're, they're feeding the poor, they're defending the innocent, they're doing all kinds of good things. But the saints that I've chosen made literary contributions, and that means that we can explore them ourselves, we can read their works. So in a real way, what we're really talking about here is who are some people that have made an influence or could have made an influence on your life and um, and I realize that for some of you that's a new thing Beekner and for some of you it's old hat so, but my hope is that everybody will be a Beekner fan after tonight. Um, Beekner by the way has an entry on the word saints in his book Wishful Thinking Carl actually used it a year or so ago. In his a holy flirtation with the world, God occasionally drops a pocket handkerchief. These handkerchiefs are called saints. Now, that's just good old Beekner right there. Um, and I think for many of us that love Beekner, he's, he's really one of those kind of handkerchiefs, God's flirtation with us. So Frederick Beekner, believe it or not, is still alive. He'll be 95 this summer. I have for some time anticipated the sad day when he would pass, but he is still alive. He doesn't write anymore, but um, lives in Vermont. I assume he may still winter down in Florida like he used to, but I don't know that for a fact. But here's a question for us. What do you know about Beekner? He's quoted by preachers all the time, so you may have just heard the name, but he is admired by laity and scholars alike, and that Notice I, I've made three audiences here, preachers, laity, and scholars, all three. It's extremely rare to find somebody that has the admiration of all three of those groups. Um, so that's worth something. But what do you know about him? What do you know about his story? What have you read by him? Just unmute yourself and jump in, anybody. Carla used him often when we were in Israel for our devotions. She did. I think she used him exclusively. She had one of his books. Yeah. Do you know where in Vermont he lives? He, he lives on Mount Rupert um, in a town called Paulet, but sometimes people say Rupert, Vermont. So I'm not sure, but he, I, I'm pretty sure his address is Paulet, Vermont, P-A-W-L-E-T. Surely this silence doesn't mean that you've never read him or know about him. Uh, while he went to seminary, I don't think he ever was a preacher. I think he uh, has always focused on writing or at some point early on made that choice. Yeah, good. Yeah, he did go to seminary. And you're right, his, his ministry has really been writing. 
Well, I've learned that his name is not pronounced the way it's spelled. That is <laughs> my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, he actually has an entry, one of those essays where he has different words. He put his last name as one of the words so that he could at least tell you that, it, you know, uh, how to pronounce it. But yeah, his name's Beekner. I think in his story, he's, um, uh, he's written several books that are quasi biography, autobiographies that kind of weave his life story with, with his theology. And he really confronts some serious issues. He had a father who committed suicide and um, had a mother who was kind of had some issues. And uh, he talks about those. And I, as I recall, doesn't ever really have any answers other than to extend love to him. Yeah. Tells about a daughter that had an eating disorder. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll, you know, a year from now, if we did this, people would be all over it because they'd say, oh, I've read everything you read, wrote. Well, here, here's something that I, I think is going to sound kind of odd to say, but I think telling you about him may be the best thing I ever do. Now, I don't mean that in some sense of false humility, as if anything else I do doesn't matter. I really mean it in that's how high of an esteem I hold him in. And, you know, Carla asked me one time, um, you know, the, a class that was coming up, I don't even remember which class it was. And she said, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, in this case, what I'm trying to accomplish, is I want to introduce you to somebody that is absolute genius and a great companion for the road. Um, here's my deserted island test. If I could only have one book on a deserted island, I, I'm going to say the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that just because I'm a minister, but if I could only read one author, I would take everything by Beekner. And in both cases, it's because of the diversity and the depth. The Bible, of course, if you're only going to have one book, that's the one I would take. It features, though, a wide range of genres and theologies. Of course, we know about the genres. It's a little bit harder pill for some people to swallow thinking about a diversity of theologies. But Beekner's work includes published sermons, memoirs that Randy mentioned, essays, and fiction. And his style is very engaging, but he's informed because, as Randy mentioned, he went to seminary, and so he's got a good theological degree. Another little image that I was thinking about today, um, Craig Barnes, who's president at Princeton Seminary, wrote a book several years ago now, The Pastor's Minor Poet. And he, in essence, says that pastors are minor poets who borrow from the major ones. So pastors say, oh, Frederick Beekner tells the story about, Barbara Brown Taylor tells the story about. Well, Beekner is one of those major prophets. And as I was saying, he's someone to accompany us on the journey. He's someone to challenge our thinking, to nourish our souls, and invite us into the deep. So this is why I really am serious when I say this could be one of the best things I ever do is introduce you to Beekner. I suppose there should be a little asterisk because that's like telling somebody about your favorite restaurant, you know, and then they go and they're saying, that's just not something I enjoyed. So I suppose it's possible, but you'll get enough of a taste of him tonight that you'll know whether or not it's even worth uh, ordering a book from him. I'm going to read quite a bit of excerpts because I really want you to get a feel for him. So here's his most central recurring theme, no question about it, is listen to your life. And so here's just a brief summary of his life story. He was born in New York City, 1926. So like I mentioned, he'll be 95 this summer. His father committed suicide when he's 10. Now you can imagine the impact that had on him. He attended Princeton University. It was interrupted. He had service in World War II and then came back. He had a religious experience at Madison Avenue Presbyterian, and I'm going to tell you more about that in just a minute. And then a couple of years later, attended Union Seminary, where among his professors were Paul Tillich and Karl Park and Reinhold Niebuhr. So yeah, Union at its heyday. He was ordained as a Presbyterian minister, but the classification of his ordination really kind of 
gave away the fact that he wasn't going to be um, a, a local pastor. In, in fact, what he did is he became the school minister at Phillips Exeter Academy. So it's kind of a prep school. And then he moved to, to Rupert, Vermont to write full time in 67. And his no novel Godric was nominated for a Pulitzer. So when we talk about the abilities of this man, I mean, Pulitzer Prize for a novel, uh, that's a pretty high nomination. But let me kind of read between the lines on some of this. He moved a lot as a child, but his grandmother's house in New York City was a constant. So if you read his memoirs and you read him, you, you kind of get a sense of a New York kind of frame of mind. His father's suicide, he said, his whole life, in a sense, became a search for his father. So this was extremely... Um, you know, impactful on his life. He, he acknowledges that when he was at Princeton, that the first two years, everybody, the, at least the men, were pretty much just waiting to go to war. And so all they did was just drink and wait. But when he came back, he dedicated himself to studies, declared English major, uh, and published some poetry, and I, I think maybe even one short story while he was still uh, an undergrad. But <clears throat> But the Madison Avenue Presbyterian story is a fascinating story. He tells it more than once in his memoirs and not exactly the same. I mean, if you give him grief for that, I would just point that the Apostle Paul does the same thing in the book of Acts and they don't even agree with each other. So I'm not sure what to make of that. But here's, here's the kind of backstory. So in 52, he's living in New York City. Greenwich Village, as I recall, and he's kind of bored, and especially on Sundays. And somebody tells him that George Buttrick is the pastor at Madison Avenue Presbyterian, which at the time, there were two very famous Presbyterian ministers there that everybody went to hear. They, they kind of had a cult status. And the only reason that he was intrigued was people told him that Buttrick uses a lot of Shakespeare and Milton in his preaching. He was a very literate kind of preacher. And in fact, in my PhD, I did a, a semester paper on George Buttrick. And um, probably, as I recall, I picked it because I knew that uh, Beekner had been converted under Buttrick. And so that was what kind of drew me to it. But here's, here is from The Sacred Journey, which is one of his memoirs, his telling of it. And it's really important because we're going to come back to it. For the first time in my life that year in New York, I started going to church regularly. And what was so farcical about it was not that I went, but my reason for going, which was simply that on the same block where I lived, there happened to be a church with a preacher I'd heard of, and that I had nothing all that much better to do with my lonely Sundays. The preacher was a man named George Buttrick. And Sunday after Sunday, I went and sermon after sermon, I heard. It was not just his eloquence that kept me coming back, though he was wonderfully eloquent, literate, imaginative, never letting you guess what he was going to come out with next, but twitching with surprises up there in the pulpit, his spectacles a glitter in the lectern light. What drew me more was whatever it was that his sermons came from and whatever it was in me that they touched so deeply. And then there came one particular sermon with one particular phrase in it that does not even appear in a transcript of his words that somebody sent me more than 25 years later. So I can only assume that he must have dreamed it up at the last minute and ad-libbed it. And on just such foolish, tenuous, holy threads as that, I suppose, hang the destinies of us all. Buttrick said that Jesus Christ refused the crown that Satan offered him in the wilderness, but he is king nonetheless, because again and again, he is crowned in the heart of the people who believe in him. And then that inward coronation takes place, Buttrick said, quote, among confession and tears and great laughter. And then Beekner writes, it was the phrase great laughter that did it, did whatever it was that I believe must have been hiddenly in the doing all the years of my journey up till then. So if you can wrap your mind around this, Buttrick goes to hear this great preacher, George Buttrick, and as he says it, those words weren't in the manuscript, or at least not that he saw, and the words great laughter kind of caused a chuckle 
to rise up in Beekner. And those words converted him. <laughs> that, that just blows me away. Uh, Union Seminary, as I mentioned, it shapes him theologically. It's one of the things that really sets him apart. People like Beekner and Barbara Brown Taylor are not only popular writers and creative writers, but they're grounded theologically. And not all people that are even good, um, you know, make good contributions necessarily have a theological degree. His ordination, he said, it was a mixed blessing. In fact, when he taught at Phillips, his most famous student was none other than John Irving of the famed uh, A Prayer for Owen Meany and so many others. And when Irving published A Prayer for Owen Meany, if you have a copy, you can look. One of the epigraphs is a quote from Frederick Buechner. But when Irving published it and sent a copy to Buechner, Buechner said to Irving, it's a good thing you don't have Reverend in front of your name or else you wouldn't be able to sell as many books. So in a way, Buechner always wanted to be a writer. And while he wasn't ashamed of the Christian faith, he felt like when people would label him as a Christian writer or a Christian author, that it kind of threw people off and they didn't quite get the whole story. So I, I, because his stress is on paying attention to one's life, I want to share with you my own encounters with his work and him. My first encounter was this book, Peculiar Treasures, which as you can see, it's a, a biblical who's who. So he doesn't have everybody that's in the Bible, but he takes a lot of the main characters and he writes a little essay about them. And they're very creative. Well, this was my graduation present from college in 1981. Uh, the Schinkels, who were members of the church where I was the youth minister, as they were sending us off to Fort Worth, gave me a copy of Peculiar Treasures. I probably would have said, well, now who's this Buchner fellow? Because I didn't know who he was. And they wrote in the front, this book is you, a fresh voice crying in the wilderness and some lovely little sentiment. But I, I, didn't, I didn't know who he was. Now, I read it and loved it. It was creative. It's alive. But I didn't really read him in seminary. Now, I think there's two reasons. One, I don't really remember my professors doing what I spent 30 years doing. And that is, I started all of my classes in seminary by reading excerpts from people like Beekner. Not always Beekner, but somebody like that, and sometimes Beekner. I don't remember my professors really doing that. I remember them just kind of having an opening prayer, maybe, or something like that. I think the other reason I didn't read him in seminary is didn't have time. We were reading all, you know, but I was looking back and because I write the date in the front of the book, I made up for lost time in 92, 93 of the 30 something books that I have by Beekner. I read a bunch of them in 92 to 93. I have a theory why, which will become clear here in a second. Okay. So my second encounter, 1992 in North Kansas City. I was browsing in a used bookstore with my good friend David May, and I saw a copy of the book, Best Sermons, 1950 to 52, or 51 to 52, whichever it is. And I was, you know, I was like, I don't know if I want to look at this. And then it hit me. That's the year that Buttrick preached that sermon. Is there any chance that it got anthologized? And sure enough, it did. So I said, oh my gosh, David, this is the sermon Buttrick preached when Beekner was converted. So I started flipping through the pages and the words great laughter were in that volume. So I was totally confused. So this being 92, I went back to the seminary. I called directory assistants and asked for Paulette Vermont, Frederick Beekner, and they gave me the number. I was surprised it was listed, first of all. And then I called. Now, I have to tell you that when I called him, I kind of felt like my mom in high school. My mom in high school somehow got Frank Sinatra's number. and <laughs> She called him. <laughs> and of course, they hung up on her. Well, I started talking as fast as I could when he answered the phone. I said, is this Frederick Bigner? And he said, yes. And, I, and then I went into this long spiel. I said, my name is Mike Graves. I teach preaching at a seminary here in Kansas City. I did my dissertation and some doctoral work and did some work on George Buttrick's preaching. I'm a big fan of yours. And uh, the sermon that you were converted under, I found a copy of. 
And I, I you know, I, I said all of that in about 10 seconds, dead silence. I thought, well, he's hung up on me. And then he said, read it. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, read the sermon to me. So I read the sermon that Buttrick preached to Frederick Beekner on the phone, and he started crying. He's a very emotional guy. And he said, if you send me a copy of that, I said, well, that's why I bought it, to send it to you. He said, if you send me a copy, I'll write you a handwritten kind of stream of consciousness letter of my memories of my conversion. So I have in my possession a four-page letter from Frederick Beekner in his handwriting that is almost impossible to read, but I can read it. And it's just an amazing treasure that I have. And um, if you ever want to see it, and I'm in person there with you, I'll be glad to show it to you. It, it's, it's really, it, it reads like Beekner. My third encounter would be inviting him to lecture. Because I'd made this connection with him and sent the book, I thought, huh, I'm going to use this, right? I'm going to be the guy that writes him and says, hey, I'm the guy that sent you that book of the Buttrick sermon. Um, he had given a lecture called Telling the Truth at Yale back in 77. And so I said, hey, you could do something along that lines or you could do you know, anything you want, really. Um, and this is what he said. Well, I, I already wrote something about preaching. So it's like, I already said what I had to say about preaching in that book, telling the truth. And, and so it just never really happened, but uh, it was fun trying. My fourth encounter would really be this last week and a half, rereading his work. I haven't read him in a while. And going back to read him, I realized just how much um, I really love it. Now, his style, I don't know if you picked up on this, even in just the little excerpt that I read you. But I think of his style as kind of beautiful, but run on. Barbara Brown Taylor refers to it as odd and looping. So I brought some examples here. Here's a passage from, uh, it would be from a sermon. And it's, it's from the book, Magnificent Defeat. I believe that we know much more about God than we admit that we know, than perhaps we all together know that we know. God speaks to us, I would say, much more often than we realize or than we choose to realize. Before the sun sets every evening, he speaks to us each in an intensely personal and unmistakable way. His message is not written out in starlight, which in the long run would make no difference. Rather, it is written out for each of us in the humdrum, helter-skelter events of each day. It is a message that in the long run might just make all the difference. Or how about this one? I isolated one for you here. This is one sentence. And, and as I said there, the, the context is he's describing how various things in life can trigger memories. There's no telling what trivial thing may do it. And then suddenly there it all is. Something that happened to us once. And it is there not just as a picture on the wall to stand back from and gaze at, but as a reality we are so much a part of and still... And that is still so much a part of us that we feel with something close to its original intensity and freshness, what it felt like, say, to fall in love at the age of 16 or to smell the smells and hear the sounds of a house that has long since disappeared or to laugh till the tears ran down our cheeks with somebody who died more years ago than we easily count for or for whom in every way that matters, we might as well have died years ago ourselves. That's one sentence. Reading Beekner aloud is a little bit harder than reading him yourself. I, I have to say that, but he is loopy. <laughs> so as for his themes, uh, the book of Beekner by Dale Brown names these seven themes. And the website, Frederick Beekner, is at least taken with this enough that they put them on the website. I don't think Beekner um, sat down and said, well, here's the seven themes. I think they really took these from Dale Brown. But what I want to say about them is, in my opinion, uh, I'm not a Beekner scholar, but I've read a lot of Beekner and studied him. I really think I would say listening to your life is his main theme. And anything else, and I certainly don't disagree with these other six, anything else really falls in a way under that first one. 
So if I were organizing it, I would have said listening to your life's his theme. But the way he does that is he says, well, you know, sometimes faith comes despite doubt and hope comes through grace, etc. So in my opinion, that's kind of the way you should think about him. He he's going to be autobiographical, but it's all going to be so that you can listen to your own life. So I'll give you an example. One of those memoirs is called Now and Then. And as you can see there, the quote, it, as it begins, if I were called upon a state in a few words, the essence of everything I was trying to say, both as a novelist and as a preacher, it would be something like this. Listen to your life. So, I mean, there you have it from his own mouth, right? There may be other themes, but there's the main one. See your life for the fathomless mystery that it is. In the boredom and pain of it, no less than in the excitement and gladness. Touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it. Because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments. And life itself is grace. So, um, he really, in essence, claims that everything he does is autobiographical. Another example in his book, Whistling in the Dark, the entry here is called News. When the evening news comes on, hundreds of thousands of people all over the earth are watching it on their TV screens or listening to it on their radios. Disasters and scandals, scientific breakthroughs and crimes of passion, the Cold War and all the smaller hot wars, negotiations that fail and others that succeed. So he goes through this first paragraph. Then he says, there is also, of course, the news that rarely, if ever, gets into the media at all. And that is the news of each particular day of each particular one of us. That is the news we're so busy making that we seldom get around to sitting down and thinking it over. So there you, you hear that theme again. Oh, okay. Another characteristic of his style is his insights into biblical text, but I think more so it's the characters. He really is good at, I'm going to say it this way, but I'll come back to this phrase. He's really good at bringing these characters to life. So in his Beecher lectures, right? So he gives the Beecher lectures in 1977 called to tell the truth or telling the truth. Um, and I'm going to, we're, a, you know, we're probably a few minutes into the lecture. But here's what he says about one of the biblical characters, in this case, Pontius Pilate. He is the procurator of Judea. On that day that he asks his famous question, what is truth? There are other things, too, that he has seen and done. He makes his first major decision before he's even had his breakfast. While still in his pajamas, he walks downstairs to the bar closet where he keeps extra cigarettes takes the two and a half cartons that he finds there and puts them out with the trash. There's the remains of a pack in the pocket of his dinner jacket and some loose ones lying around the house in various cigarette boxes. All of these he carefully destroys, slitting them open with his thumbnail and flushing the tobacco down the toilet. After dinner the evening before, the talk turned to politics and he was up for hours talking and smoking so that when he awoke, his tongue felt hot and dry his whole chest raw inside like a wound. He knows about the Surgeon General's warning. He has seen the photographs of a smoker's lungs. He has been a three-pack-a-day man, for better or worse, more than 30 years, so his breakfast decision is decision for life against death, and he sees it as his death that he slits open with his thumbnail and flushes away. So if you can imagine the way that he's brought pilot to life and by the way <clears throat> this is not a totally fanciful thing now we have no record of of pilot being a smoker but in the gospel of john pilot goes out on the balcony during the trial of jesus and then he comes back in and jesus never moves but pilot is just flitting about so it kind of has that feel to it and then <clears throat> one of my favorite excerpts this is from his novel, The Son of Laughter. So, <clears throat> okay, so who, uh, I need your input here. You can unmute yourself. Who in the Bible is named Laughter? Isn't it Isaac? 
That's right, Isaac. Very good. Yeah, Isaac, <clears throat> remember it was named laughter. That's what it means in Hebrew because Sarah laughed when she found out she's going to have a baby. Well, son of laughter would be Jacob. So he calls the novel about Jacob, son of laughter. Now he's going to back up into the Abraham narrative and into the Isaac, you know, into the uh, Isaac narrative and then into the, the Jacob narrative with Esau and his, his brother. But <clears throat> this is how, and, and you got to go back and read Genesis if you don't get all of these references. But this is how the novel begins. They all had names, but I've forgotten them. One man, name sounded like a man hocking up a bone. Another went Lulu, like a man with a woman under him. Another rattled like the god of a tree. One name was so tiny and dry, you hardly dared speak of it for fear it would crumble to dust on your lips. They were no taller than from my wrist to the tip of my middle finger. They lived on a shelf in my uncle's cellar. My uncle was Laban. The cedar walls were of earth. It was always black down there, even when the sun was high. One of the gods was a bearded child in a high-peaked cap. Another wore a skirt of fish scales with plump toes and a round full belly. Another was bald and beardless. He held his member out before him in both hands. He had no eyes and only a crack in the stone for his mouth. They told my uncle many things that he lusted to know. They told him where to look for the missing goat or the strayed lamb. They told him where, when to plant and where in the city of Haran to buy for least and sell for most. They told him about rain. I've seen him come lurching up the ladder so drunk on their secrets that his eyes were rolling around his head and his jaw hanging. He kept a lamp burning down there for them at all hours. He fed them on barley cakes, honey cakes, radishes, beer. He rubbed them with oil, their beards and bellies, their fat toes. He burned things from them. So he goes on and on. And then he describes when, you may remember, when he and his wives flee from the father, uh, the father-in-law in this case, from, uh, from Haran with Laban. And, and um, Rachel, one of his wives, sits on all the gods when the father shows up, his father-in-law. And it's just a brilliant scene. I mean, just that quick, you, you get this sense of the, well, what's, what's technically called verisimilitude. It feels so real. You know, sometimes when you're reading in Genesis or Exodus, whatever, it just feels ancient in Bible, but he, he makes it feel different. Now, there's an interesting theological debate here because some people would say, oh, he's, he's made them feel relevant, but others say, no, we've made ourselves to be relevant to them. But however you look at it, it's a very accessible style. Uh, and then we also, if you were with us for the Holy Week service, we used his uh, coffee table book. Uh, the the faces of Jesus, and I we kind of we drew on that for all of the images. This is a great book that actually is <laughs> more affordable than I ever realized nowadays. I don't know if it's because he's not as popular or what, but it's got all these great photos and meditations by him. Um, I drew on it for the introduction to that series that we did that night on Holy Week, and told a story about his. Uh, going to see a movie back in the 60s and 70s in the face of Jesus. So here's where I'm going to pause and just say that I think if you want to read him, you have several options. I and mean, you got, I think it's 37, 38 books now. But here would be my recommendations. And you can take them with a grain of salt. I think fiction, you do really well to do Son of Laughter. Um, you know, you could read the biblical story along with it. Secrets in the Dark is his uh, collection of his life and sermons. So it's got pretty much all of his published sermons. And then nonfiction, I would say listening to your life is a great way to get started because if you can see there the subtitle, it's just a daily meditations. So you can look up, you know, April the 19th and you can read um, usually one or two paragraphs. But the reason I think this is a really good way to start is not only do you get a smattering of different pieces, but you might find, because they're labeled in the back, you might say, oh, this is so clever and creative on whatever the topic is for the day. And so you could look in the back and figure out what book that's from, and that would get you going as well. Okay, I'm going to pause there for a second, see if you have any 
thoughts or questions or comments so far after all that material? It's on. Um, uh, Mike, there's also an online source. Uh, it's, I think it's through the Beekner Institute or something like that. That's called Quote of the Day, where they take it's it's very similar to listening to your life, except it's maybe not quite as structured. But they take various quotes from um, two or three paragraphs from one of his books or writings. Yeah, I have a slide on that later, and the reason I do is because of you. Um, Randy, every once in a while, when when the quotes just, I don't know, when it just hits him right, he right. forwards it to me because I don't subscribe to it, but uh, I love getting it. And so I, I do have a slide about that because you can go on the Frederick Beekner website. It's just frederickbeekner.org and you go to the little feature, My Beekner, and you can subscribe to the quote of the day. Yeah, and you can, um, you can also... Um by a number of his books. I think even some of those that may not be, uh, have trouble getting through a bookstore, you can get through that website. It's the Beekner Institute or something. Yeah, good. Someone else? Okay. Um, so there it is, right? My frederickbeekner.com. If you go, I think it's in the upper right corner. If you go to my Beekner, you can just sign up. I think there's even a newsletter too. I'm not sure about that. One thing though, um, that's kind of interesting. If you're ever asked to do a devotional or you're going to teach a class or you're just interested in a topic, there's a search box at the bottom. You have to really go down to find it. I mean, it's way down at the bottom. Um, it's, it's probably used more by preachers because when you put it in, it brings up uh, all kinds of what they label sermon illustrations, but it's a way, you know, if you were doing something on prayer, or if you were doing something on fasting, or you were doing something on discipleship, you can just put in these kind of key words, and they'll give you, um, you know, a couple of different options there to look at. Okay, so any reflections or questions? Y'all are a very quiet group tonight. I don't know how to interpret that, because I can't see you. I don't know if it's because he's totally new to you or you're so, um, you know, up to date on Beekner that this is just nothing new or what? Uh, Mike, it is Elizabeth Buckner speaking. Hey, Elizabeth. And I just was texting Carrie Beth um, about the class. And she said, uh, we have all of his books. And I said, Mike just said there are lots of them, 38. And she said that when she and her now husband first met, Beekner was a point of connection. So they do have all of the um, all of the books. So I thought you'd get a kick out of that. But yeah, that's really she and her now husband <laughs> had, had multiple dates because of Beekner. Yeah. Well, and the crazy thing is that um, Carrie Beth was in college when I was interim minister at her church in Arkansas twenty something years ago, and. Uh, because she was away at college we didn't see each other much but when she was home we connected over Beekner and um, so it's really funny yeah I'm actually doing a year-long uh, sermon series on biblical characters oh yeah and I had totally forgotten about peculiar treasures so mm -hmm. I just pulled that out yeah good good yeah, yeah. Yeah, some people have found his biblical characters, it's really interesting, this comment, they found it offensive. And when you ask them about that, they say, well, you know, like, and I mean, I've literally heard people say, Pilate is smoking, and some of them are cussing, and they're sleeping around. And I always just say, well, have you read the Bible? Do you not know what these characters were up to? <laughs> they were a mess. You know, that's why when people say uh, we want to reclaim traditional biblical family values, I, I don't think you do. Not, not really. Uh, Abraham, you know, lies about his wife, not once, but twice. And um, Jacob's got a couple of wives and he's a jerk to his brother. And yeah. Anyone else? 
what did what did you if you're not if you knew nothing about Beekner before this, what's something that intrigues you about him or that um, you have a question about anybody? Well, um, I'm, I'm suffering from the fire hose effect, Mike. Uh, um, so the important thing that besides this broad introduction is that you several times mentioned how accessible he was, which reduces my um, trepidation about reading something of his, um, because if he's accessible, I can find my way through it. Yeah, he's he's going to take. I, I mean, there's nothing he writes where you'll be at a loss. There's nothing where you say, "I don't, I don't even know what he's trying to say." He's always very clear. When he takes any concept, he's going to make it about as simple as it gets, but in a very profound way. Uh, I I don't have it in front of me, but I remember one of his definitions, descriptions of grace is he has this one sentence that he repeats three times, but he puts an emphasis on a different word each time. There's nothing you have to do. And then he goes, there's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. That's grace. And so, I mean, he just takes concepts like that and he'll make them very simple. So he's, he's, um, he's, he, he's, he's, He's got a scholarly background, but he doesn't write in a scholarly style. He writes in what I would call a very poetic kind of prose. Loopy, loopy sentences, but, but very accessible. I love the laughter that he puts in it all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's definitely got some funny stuff. Mike, could you unpack a little bit more? What does it mean to listen to your own life? Well, his, his main point isn't just that he's going to write from his, and so therefore he's kind of justifying it. He, he's of the opinion, uh, and, and he, he just says it straight out, that's all there is. <laughs> you know, all you have is your life. And so what he's trying to show you is, that, yeah, there's these great high peak moments, you know, when a, a grandchild is born or when uh, a child is born or when your uh, one of your kids gets married. I mean, there are these moments and then there's these really low moments of the diagnosis came back as malignant or whatever. But he says, even in the just the every day of life, that's all there is. And this is how God speaks to us in the every day. And so, like he'll tell a story I've told it before where he was very discouraged, uh, the daughter that had an eating disorder and some other things were going on. And he went for a drive and he was out in the countryside and he just pulled over and, and just felt just totally distraught. And a car drove by with a license plate that had one word on it, trust. And that was the word he needed. It was the word that lifted him up and later found out it belonged to uh, a trust officer to bank. So it wasn't meant to be, you know, some theological statement. And yet that's what he needed. And so he's very autobiographical in the way he does that. I and mean, he, he's kind of like Fred Craddock in that way. He's going to take everyday things that happen. And those are going to be um, opportunities to hear something that God is doing in the world. So he's very big on God active in the world and that everything that's happening around us He's not going to claim that everything is God's will, that, you know, wars and, and whatever, but that everything that's happening is an opportunity for us to be observant and for God to speak. Are some of his books in the church library? Yes. I don't know how many. Um, I don't know if Becky knows the answer to that, but yes. Yeah, quite a few. Quite a few. Quite a few. How about in the well? Do we know if any of them are there? Don't know the answer to that. Um, the well, that's a bookstore, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. I don't know, but we can certainly get some once we're open again. This crazy. 
Well, so I thought I'd close this with a prayer of his. A uh, couple things first. This is what he says about prayer. I mean, you can see the first line there. Everybody prays, whether he thinks of it as praying or not. The odd silence you fall into when something very beautiful is happening or something very good or very bad. So there, Suzanne, you can kind of see that notion of paying attention. The awe that sometimes floats up out of you as out of a 4th of July crowd when the skyrocket bursts over the water. The stammer of pain at someone else's pain. The stammer of joy at somebody else's joy. Whatever words or sounds you use for sighing with over your own life. These are all prayers in their way. These are all spoken not just to yourself, but to something even more familiar than yourself and even more strange than the world. Bigner hasn't, I thought it was kind of interesting, hasn't really published a lot of prayers, but in his collection um, of sermons and uh, called, as you can see there, The Hungering Dark, he does close each one of those with a prayer which I'm assuming when he preached in the churches where he preached, that's how he ended the sermon, which is a, a kind of uh, tradition that is still done in some places. And I thought that this one might be a good one for us to close with. Thou God in Christ, there is no ground anywhere that is not holy ground. For in the cool of the evening, thou hast walked upon it. And in the heat of the day, thou hast died upon it. And at the coming of dawn, thou hast returned and art always and everywhere returning to it and to us who walk upon it too, this holy ground, though heedless of its holiness. Oh, make us whole, set us free. Thou didst shape us each in the darkness of a womb to give us life. And thou knowest us each by name and not one is forgotten by thee, not one, but is precious in thy sight, the ugly with the beautiful, the criminal with the child, the enemy with the friend. Lord, give us eyes to see each other and ourselves more nearly as thou seest us, to see beneath each face we meet and beneath even our own faces, thy face. Help us to know that for each thou hast died as though he were the whole only one. Amen. I have one more surprise for you. It's a good one. So, the Beecher Lectures are established at Yale Divinity School. They go way back, 150 years or more. When Beekner delivered his Beecher Lecture in 1977, and by the way, I would recommend even reading this one, even though some people would say it's a book for preachers. It, it's a book about preaching, but it is, well, you heard the pilot part. But there was one person present whose life would be changed because of that lecture. Anybody want to guess? Nobody wants to guess. Carla? You. Carla. <laughs> nope. No, nope, wasn't Carla. You. I think she'd have, been, she'd have been a little young at that point. How about Phil? Nope. Not George? You. Nope. You ready? Barbara Brown Taylor. And I'll tell you this, Barbara Brown Daler would not necessarily be a name you know if she hadn't been at that lecture. And she's the person we're gonna look at next week. So I'll tell you the story next week of what happened. And we'll, we'll look at Barbara's life and her writings. Anybody last thoughts or questions, comments? I, I love a cliffhanger ending. <laughs> Good, good. I'm reading her lectures right now of When God is Silent. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she gave the, the Beecher lectures when God is silent. That's right. That's a good one, too. I used to read that to my classes, parts of it. Well, I, love, I, I love the fact, I mean, Barbara Bound Taylor looks like I would think Barbara Bound Taylor should look. And just recently, even though I've read her for a long time, for whatever the reason, I just saw my first picture of 